Well, pretty excited this show because we're um, sitting down with one of the legends of Australian motorcycling and uh, I've got to tell you, you know, we, we met this guy uh, a couple of months ago on a, on a ride, had a bit of a chat, said, do you know, mind if we're having, uh, having you on the show and he's gone, absolutely. So um, please welcome to iRide, Daryl Beatty. Thanks, Thanks mate. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, it's been a long time. I don't think I was ever a legend, but th <laughs> thank you for tagging me in that or hashtag these days hey, if hey, the younger right. generation's watching. But, Absolutely. Um, no, it's been amazing. You know, and it's funny just quickly as you mentioned that that yeah, you know, my young bloke's on schoolies right now. Um, yeah, I am a nervous parent, but uh, <laughs> you know he's. He wasn't around when I raced, but he obviously sees what I do now with Dalbeedy Adventures. But it's, um, I don't think much of my past, but he reminds me every now and then, and he probably still doesn't know much about it. So yeah, it's good to chat about it sometimes. Well, you know, I think probably for a lot of guys that are out there riding um, my age, of your age, um, you're a star. You're, you were a star, and you were riding with some of the biggest names in motorcycling history. Uh, Mick Doohan, of course, mm. Wayne Gardner, Schwantz, you know, the, the list is endless and, and you were there in amongst them. Yeah. I was lucky. Uh, I was fortunate. Um, I grabbed opportunity when it was available and made the most of it um, all the way through my career. So, um, yeah, when I do look back on it, I think of those names that you talk about and many others even from my beginnings from and the dirt these, track and these are just guys that mates of yours right yeah mates that we haven't seen for a long time but they are you know and, and that's one of the things I love about Phillip Island when you know MotoGP comes to Australia I get to go down there do my TV work for MotoGP but also get to catch up with people that I've known for yeah half my life yeah that's so, right so uh, and it's still very loyal you know good friends Okay, for those that don't know the story, uh, and there's probably a few out there that it's probably... It's a good one, I think. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> you won your first motorbike on, on Agro Radio, radio Show. I was... Uh, so re I'm born in Charleville in Western Queensland. My, my mum and dad spent 20 years out in that area. So I, I am... I'm not a bushy. I'm a, I'm a half-half, but... Um, I do I do love it out there. I, lo I love the bush, uh, hence why I love the tours that I do. But in 1979, at that stage, we were living in Brisbane, on the south side of Brisbane, and um, Agro Cartoon Connection was on, I think it was Jackie or Fiona McDonald, and it come up, a uh, Suzuki RM50, guess, guess the weight. And it was just before I was heading to school, so I rang, at that stage it was a suburb, just, well it still is, near Ipswich called Dinmore. Yep. Um, and it was Daryl Reek's Suzuki. There was a store there near the railway line from memory. And I rang it, the number, and said, hi, I'm after the weight of an RM50T. Uh, I got you here, the phone go down, the, the sheet come out, it's 56 kilos. I said to mum, it's 56 kilos, I'm off to school. Well, luckily, my mum put in 10 envelopes. Didn't think any more of it. You know, you're busy being a kid doing your thing, hating school and doing all that sort of stuff. And uh, a letter coming in the mail from Channel 7, I still have the letter somewhere, saying, congratulations, that it was drawn today at Tivoli Raceway at Mr. Motocross or a motocross round. Uh, you're the winner. I couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> at first, probably didn't think much of it. Yep. Just thought, wow, a motorbike. You know, I was never going to own a motorbike. No one in the family rode motorbikes. Dad rode a TT500 every now and then to work, but we weren't a motorsport family. So, um, yeah, that, that was the start of me on two wheels. It's funnily enough, Toby Price, I think we talked about this yeah. as well, Toby Price um, kind of conned you know, a motorbike out of uh, out of the footy show as well, didn't he? So that was pretty interesting, you know, you, you both along that path. Look, if anyone looks into your history, um, you really became a name uh, pretty much after the Suzuka 8 hour, uh, where you teamed up and won that with uh, Wayne Gardner. Yep. But it was a long road from a, a little guy with a, with a little 50cc Suzuki through to ending up in Japan. Tell me how that happened, given the fact that your family wasn't a motorsport family. I think sometimes, and maybe even more so now, but I think it's for everyone. It's everything. If 
if you're going to be the best or try to be the best at something or reach the pinnacle or whatever your chosen sport is, whether you're you know, a woman or a, or a man, it's a long road, business, anything. So for me, it was really from winning that bike in 1980, uh, Dad was a plumber, Mum was a school teacher. Uh, we had to learn quickly. I rode in the bush for a year. I got used to get caught told not to ride in the bush. Then we joined what you do, mini bike club, did all the right thing, got racing, did that for six years, won Australian titles on dirt track, uh, wanted to go speedway, went road racing. Um, Hang on, just tell us about that story, because you, you had a little Jawa, didn't you? So I had a two-valve Jawa. Speedway was a thing for me in those days. I love the smell of methanol and castor oil. <laughs> still do. Uh, still do. <laughs> I think it's one of the best forms of motorsport. Yep. Great family night out. And I was underage, had some people help me, wasn't allowed to ride any other events until I was 16, I was 15 at that stage. Uh, went and watched the Swan Series at Surface Paradise Raceway, uh, loved it, said to Dad, that's what I want to do. I was at school at that stage, hadn't finished year 10, left school at year 10, yep. worked at a bike shop which was a guy called John Oliver who uh, was Maruki Yamaha who eventually started Team Moto. Right. Uh, J.O. was a great, great guidance for me in my early days. Um, allowed me time off to go race and do whatever I wanted to do. So there was a stepping stone through all that stuff. Race 250 Grand Prix in Australia. And it is Daryl Beatty just settling himself. And Jeffrey Sales in second place. And Hortonsburg. And at the moment Whitehouse is fourth. And that's the way they go across the line. It was Darrell Beatty on 16, from Geoffrey Sale on 10, from David Horton on 27, and Stephen Whitehouse, 72, came home in fourth place. And to do that, Darrell Beatty had to produce a new lap record, a 141.6. Now, originally got noticed, got signed my first ever contract with Honda in 1989. Okay. The day I signed it, I remember Jeff Lee's been there signing his contract when he was racing World Motocross. Um, I think my first contract in 1989 was $10,000, uh, and it took off. That yeah. was the start of my big time road racing as, as a guy in Australia. Mm. Who were the guys that kind of inspired you back then? Because you know you were racing with guys that were probably, again, Australian motorcycle legends, Andrew Johnson, um, mm. you know, Mal Campbell, you got yep. Warren Willing and Greg Hansford and all those guys that were kind of... Well, Wally, yeah. Wally Malcolm Campbell was my teammate. Yep. Was a great teammate to have. Uh, awesome talent. Yep. Amazing term determination. Uh, he was good with me, he helped me. I think, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but when I look back on it, and at the time I didn't realise it, and I think when you're young you don't, you just got your head down doing your thing, and all I wanted to do was ride a motorcycle as fast as I couldn't have fun. Yeah. So, but you know, the likes of guys like Geoffrey Sale, who had European experience, he was a competitive front runner on the right machinery, had obviously left Europe, come back to Australia towards the end of his career, so all of a sudden I'm, I'm coming through the ranks and he's this guy with this enormous amount of experience. What's that going to do to me? That's going to make me push to be as good as him yeah. and if not better. So the, my timing for many things, you know, it's luck in some ways, but was perfect. Um, you know, in those days there weren't many Australian kids coming from dirt track to road racing. So it was probably easier for me to get noticed in those days. Now it's tougher because yeah not everyone wants to do it but a lot of people are doing it yeah. so I was very lucky with timing and a lot of things I'd hate to do it now I probably wouldn't get through now you yeah. know I don't know but um, yeah very very I look back and think how fortunate I was yep before we start talking about um, you know what you're doing now uh, that that step from Japan uh, the Suzuka 8 hour and where they where they kind of fast tracked you into the 500 um, you know GP series uh, must have been pretty incredible because mm. then you're living that European lifestyle aren't yeah you? yeah well uh, you know for me initially as a young bloke 18 19 leaving Australia used to burn around a jet ski on my weekends off with mates dumped in Shinjuku and Tokyo into a small room this is where you're gonna live this is where you're gonna race motorcycles 
uh, I wouldn't say I loved it, but I knew that that's what I wanted to do. Um, but again, I look back and Japan were the days that made me grow up and become an adult, uh, made me who I am now. I love Japan as a country. Uh, I was nearly like a son in those days to Mr. Aguma son, who was the president of Honda Racing Corp Corporation. He'd come and get me on his days off uh, when we had no racing or they didn't have me in a, at a proving ground testing in wind tunnels and that sort of stuff. Uh, and he, he loved um, ninja houses, so I got dragged around ninja ha houses <laughs> and temples all over Japan. I probably didn't necessarily want to do it, but look back, wow, I'm glad I did it. So there was a lot of cultural changes for me, um, and I think in some ways that really prepared me for Europe. Europe was a lot easier than Japan because of the language barrier, even though everyone at Honda spoke and practiced English in classes at Honda. so. Those few years I had in Japan made me close with the factory. Um, I got to see a lot of stuff you wouldn't normally see internally in the factory. I got to test stuff that never made it to racing. Uh, injection in early days, um, you know, twin crank NSR 500s that never existed, all, right. um, all that sort of stuff. So for me it was, yeah, an amazing time and, and an easy step to Europe then. Yeah, those 500s were beasts by comparison to, I mean, the bikes these days, you know, pretty amazing technologically mm. wise, but those 500s are just a reputation of, you know. <laughs> they are, and it's interesting hearing people talk about it, and I'm sure if a modern day guy got on one now, he'd go, oh my God, how gutless is this <laughs> thing? You know, it's a bit like when you jump on a, you know, RGB 500 or an RZ 500 from the past on the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a beast, but yeah. now it's got nothing yeah. on a 1,000 cc sports bike, yeah. so. But they were, they, you know, for their time and the tyres we had, but we thought they were the best. Yep. Um, yep. But yeah, I think my best memories of them, and again, the, you know, I was there right on that cusp of the change. When I first rode a 500, it was 115 kilos. So yep. that's the weight of a, that's lighter than an Enduro 450. Yeah. And they had a, anywhere between 180 and 195 or 98 horsepower. So. Yeah, you know, and a 450's got what 40 horsepower yeah, yeah. or something. So it, it gives you an idea of the power to weight. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Yeah. You know, six gear was like first gear, and so yeah. is the bikes they ride today. Yeah. So um, I kind of try not to compare them because it's such a different time. Um, but the racing now, I think, is more competitive than it's ever been. It's How good was this season? Oh, like phenomenal, phenomenal. One of the best MotoGP seasons. I and that makes me more proud than anything to yeah. think that he's this this sport that I love, that I stumbled across by winning a motorbike, that gave me a, a, the life I have now and the people I meet, but makes me proud to sit back and think, you know what, it's not just me, but there's a lot of people now saying it's the best form of motorsport in the world. You know, Formula One's, it's a big show, yeah. but the racing's not like what we see. Yeah. And yeah, and to have a guy like Valentino Rossi that's feels like he's in everyone's lounge room yep. and then someone yep. like Marquez that'll put a move on anyone at any time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Why wouldn't you sit down and watch it? The 500ccs took five year toes. Yes. Um, yes. And so hang and five. been a lot of jokes around that. Yeah. We share yeah. them. I'm happy to share them. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, well, I did notice you don't wear thongs, but you can wear Crocs. So. <laughs> I wear Crocs to... Uh, they were, uh, that wasn't a popular decision for my wife initially. <laughs> I found out that Crocs were a no-no. No, no right. Um, I'll tell you all, she now has a pair of Crocs. <laughs> it suits where we live. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, initially it was, for anyone, it was scary. Um, when that happens and it goes through a chain and sprocket, you know, all your skin pulls back. They thought I'd lost half my foot. Once I got to Paris and the surgery was done, I had complications for probably a few years before it was finally fixed properly. And again, it was done in Australia and Brisbane in Wickham Terrace by a great surgeon called Dr. Andrew Jenkins. Um, they took an artery out of my arm and placed it in my foot. And this was years after it happened and it fixed it. Yeah. But yeah, I remember Mick Dorn saying to me not long after the accident, um, you know, you know Daryl never got picked up by an ambulance. He was picked up by a tow truck. You know, so <laughs> the jokes discontinued and continued. So there's a yeah. few others that yep. uh, 
that we use every yeah. now and then, but I won't, I won't say them <laughs> on your show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. But, but that wasn't what ended your career, it was, uh, it was another big uh, No, I rode six that. weeks after that. <coughs> so I had such a great season in 95 with Suzuki, the Finnish um, runner-up in the World Championship to yep. Mick. We were testing in 96, and the start of our testing was going really well. Our race runs were going well, times were going well. Suzuki were looking, obviously, for more grunt. Uh, and they went through a period for a fair while there, and I think it happened even for years after I stopped at times, but they were doing a lot of piston development, and it was it was basically seizing, but they were tearing the tops off pistons. So I was just unlucky at that time that during that development, uh, you know, for me it was in high speed, flat, fifth gear, like Shower Alarm and places like that, where it was just seasoned, full lean, 200 odd kilometers an hour, banging my head. And I guess it, for me, eventually it was just like a boxer. You know, there was yeah. too many concussions. Um, and I had a few in a row. Yep. And then I had a, a big one in France. And um, that was kind of it, really. Yeah. I, I, um, I don't remember much of it. I remember seeing my dad through the ambulance window. I'd punctured a lung and, yeah. and had surgery and all that sort of stuff. But enough was enough. It took time to come back. I wanted to get back. Yeah. I got back and rode, but felt funny. Yeah. And I didn't know why. Uh, and eventually took the rest of the year off because I uh, was told by a neurosurgeon I had swelling still. So I took that time off and then tried to come back for the final year in 97 and did race but never felt the same yeah. and couldn't work it out. Again, came back to Brisbane, Wickham Terrace, where the specialists are, and they worked out that I'd, from the impacts, uh, I'd ruptured my middle ear. So I was always had that Out dizzy, vertigo, kind vertigo of thing. feeling, yeah. which was hard on a motorbike changing direction. So I had surgery for that, um, and I'm all good now. There's certain things that I do, I feel it a little bit, but um, yeah, it's, um, you know, I've got no complaints. I was 27, same age as Casey when he left. Um, certainly had nowhere near the success he had, but uh, yeah, no again, regrets. coming from winning the motorbike and getting that amount of time mm. there, I've got to be grateful for that. Yeah. Just in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the ending of your career and, and, and you moved into more of a broadcasting role and commentary mm. role, um, I, I'm interested to see this uh, new e-bike uh, turn up, but but really m for for a couple of reasons. One is, Seto Gibbonow is coming back to ride. Um, someone asked Mick Doohan the other day if he was going to ride the zero. So you're I in that age group. I know where what that answer would be, but I, <laughs> again, I can't say that on your show. <laughs> what about you? you any, any chance to get nah, you back in leathers? No, I think I think one of the important things in life is to know when you've had enough. So, right. Um, I certainly had, but you know I think. I think electric has obviously got potential in certain areas for the future, and we're seeing a lot of it, uh, or hybrid. But my personal opinion for MotoGP at the moment, I think it's a long way away. Yeah. I think the gaming stuff's going to be yeah. more popular than that with it with the young generation. So I think time will tell. But you know, for for kids wanting to ride motorbikes in in suburbia or even areas where I live on a couple of acres, I think it has a great great place. Yeah. But um, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm still yep. a bit old-fashioned like that, and I love love the smell and the noise. Yeah, and as you said, you know, castor oil over soldering iron. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> well, we're just going to interrupt the interview with Daryl there because, uh, you know, he such a great interview, his racing career and, and his broadcasting career, and then we talk next about what he's doing now, and that's Daryl Beatty Adventures. Unfortunately, it's going to make the segment really, really long, so we thought what we'd do is we would stop it there, and then in the January show, we'll bring you Daryl Beatty Adventures, and Daryl takes us through his truck, shows us the setup, it's fantastic, uh, his bikes and the tours that he does, the locations. So stand by for the January show, and we'll bring you part two of the Daryl Beatty uh, interview, Daryl Beatty Adventures.